Hey, 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 what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like Live. I'm Jared Ball, always happy to be your host. Again, as always, please make sure you are subscribed and following at imixwhatilike.org and at I Mix What I Like for all your relevant social media so you don't miss any of the good stuff that we're doing across multimedia and beyond just this live stream. We have some announcements coming. Uh, probably right around uh, February 1st for Black History Month. Uh, yeah, so a lot happening. So we're, we're so please join the YouTube channel, become a member there. Uh, your contributions, your support will be definitely helping uh, the building out. So better than build back better or whatever Biden be BSing about. Ha. Uh, we will be actually building something out better uh, and your contributions will help. So please uh, consider that. And as always, make sure you get the, the uh, prisoner newsletter from Freedom Archives. Make sure you are supporting prisonerradio.org, uh, the Jericho Movement dot com or dot org. I'll double check that in a second. Forgive me. Uh, freejaleel.com uh, and uh, go back and check our interview with Sophia Elijah from last week so that you can get caught up on the free Sundiata campaign uh, and support that. And then also the uh, Dr. Karanja Carroll interview so you can get caught up on uh, Beyond the Slogan Asada Taught Me. So we want to support political prisoners as they've really continue to give up everything for us. So, all right, with that said, we're going to spend the next hour. This is going to be a great evening because we're going to spend the next hour uh, with our first guest, and then she's going to come back and join us for a second hour with our guest uh, at seven o'clock Eastern, which is Kali Akuno uh, of so many things, but uh, uh, including uh, um, uh, Jackson Rising, uh, uh uh, the, uh, I'm just gone blank on, on the Jackson campaign, but we'll talk with him about that and many other things going on, but specifically uh, about black exploitation, the new black exploitation, and you know what's going on with that and how it relates to the political activism uh, and work that he has been doing for a long time. So got a lot going on, uh, so stick around. But joining me now is going to be, of course, Rosa Clemente, who among many other things is an activist, a journalist, a scholar, uh, and host of Disrupt the Chaos. Uh, and she's going to be here to talk with us about a number of things, but specifically this question that she's been dealing with and at the really the forefront of for a long time, which is the, the, this question over, uh, um, well, on the one hand, who is Black? Uh, we, we will be talking to her about her famous essay, uh, uh, raising that question. Uh, and then we'll also be talking to her about her more recent work, work and question around who is Latina? Uh, specifically around this, these, these, uh, the, the, the recent outings, so to speak, of uh, Natasha Lycia Ora Banan, and we'll get her to check me on that pronunciation, and more famously, Jessica Krug. So, all of that and more, please welcome, of course, our dear sister, Rosa Clemente. Welcome back, Rosa. It's always good to see you. How are you doing? Dr. Jarrett Ball. You know, you know how I greet you. And you said it perfectly because, of course, your wife is an Afro Panamanian and you have two Afro Panamanian daughters. So I would expect nothing less from you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So. I don't even know where to begin, um, but the other day we were talking and you you were I mean, Actually, there was also something else I wanted to bring up with you while you're here, because there's been two new reports this week uh, about Latino buying power. Ah, right, right. Um, so uh, uh, these myths are just transnational uh, for sure. Uh, uh, but anyway, but we were talking the other day and, and I really hadn't thought a lot about of what you were saying in terms of the way the Latin American diaspora has been responding to these 
popular outings of white women posing as Latinas and taking prominent positions within the activist and academic community as spokespeople for the Latin American and specifically Latina community. Uh, and I was shocked at the way you were describing some of the responses both here and in Puerto Rico, where I have to admit I was I, I'm naive. I, I just am still naive to a lot of things about why why there was still so much ap apparently acceptance of these women as spokes or at least one of these women as spokespeople, um, and the different ways that people in the diaspora are responding to this issue. So anyway, please, if you would break down as best you can what it has been going on, both in terms of what these women have been doing and then how, since they've been exposed, they've been uh, the reaction within the, the community. Yeah, so what I call them is the Latina Karen, Carenas. <laughs> Carenas. The Carenas. <laughs> also, what's interesting about them both is that they claim Puerto Rican heritage, right? Right, 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 right. So, you know, and that means something in terms of Puerto Rico still being colonized and still a colonial vestige of the United States of America. I actually don't put Puerto Rico into the Latin American, Hispanic, L Latin at all, okay? Puerto Rico is in the Caribbean, just like the Dominican Republic resides with Haiti. And I think it's important for people to realize that most Africans that were taken from the continent did not end up in the United States, but they did end up in what we now know, Latin America, Central America, and the Spanish speaking Caribbean islands, right? So look, it, it didn't surprise me that there were these like white women that claimed to be Puerto Rican. I had met Rachel Dolezal mm. right before the Rachel Dolezal thing blew up. I actually was brought out there by one of my sisters who's um, Boricua, Elijah Miranda, who's now at San Diego State University. And actually Rachel Dolezal in my lecture and the night before, if people who do college speaking engagements, you usually get there the night before and you have this dinner. And I had that dinner that Elijah put together. And when I went back with Elijah to her home, which was where she hosted me, I was like, yo, she's white, right? And Elijah was like, well, people have been actually talking about that. I'm like, yeah, I've seen these white girls before. And from my experience, from where I grew up, I grew up in the South Bronx until I was seven or eight. And then my parents moved me to Westchester County. So for those in New York state, it's like the Bronx is 22 miles from Westchester County, but it's two different worlds. That section I grew up in the Bronx is the Ports Congressional District. That's the one that AOC represents right now. And I moved to a suburb that was um, the second richest suburb after Beverly Hills in the United States. But at that time, the village that I, I lived in a village called Elmsford, it's a village, it's that small, that I was, we were the only Latino, Latina, Puerto Rican, whatever, Hispanic family in that area. So I went to a high school that was very small. It was African-American, white Americans, some Asian Americans, and me. But I never felt like I was out of place because I was in quickly embraced by the African-American brothers and sisters, including um, one of my best friends, Tanya. You know, so I was just like, yeah, she's white. I've seen these girls before. And then like two years later, I'm living in LA and one of my homegirls is like, oh my God, did you see that Rachel Dolezal always white? I'm like, yeah, I knew that already, you know? <laughs> so. By the way, did you see that <laughs> Netflix documentary about her? I did, I did watch it. You know, that and joint was I did watch it. I really hope one day that the son and the father put something out together, because I just thought it was so deep that he refused to be on camera, the father. Yeah. And that one part where the son just said, if she would just admit she's white, it would all be over. I was like, yeah. damn. 
damn. Anyway, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. You hit on the point right there. Yeah. So when it came out that Natasha um, was white, it was so many other Boricuas that were like, she could have said she was white and had good politics, right? So like, hey, everybody, some of my best friends are white women. <laughs> hey. I mean, I mean actually, like, let me just say this. One of my real, real, real best friends, um, her, her name is Dana Kaplan. And she, I met her over 20 years ago through the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, but also through the work that she was doing with the Prison Moratorium Project. And currently- And you had, I had the pleasure of meeting her once through you and, and, yeah. and never once did she say she's, uh, you know, Puerto Rican <laughs> or, you know what I mean? It was just, she was just, the white girl who had good politics. <laughs> you know, good politics. Dana has imbued herself with an <laughs> industrial complex. And yeah. she's part of the team that has moved towards closing Rikers. So I always tell Dana, I'm like, you're extra special because also you're Russian. Mm. So I'm like, mm, you know, but. But see, you but know, the other part is, but even people you've done support work over for years, the late Marilyn Buck, David Gilbert. I mean, these are white folks, political prisoners who, again, it's not about friends. I mean, that's funny. It's cool. But it's about whose politics. I mean, if you have good politics, you can find a place in, in, in and not have to run this hustle. So I don't understand. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I know. And I, and I agree with that. It's like, you don't have to run the hustle, you know? And that's what I appreciate about my girl, Dana. It's like, she's always been who she is. And also been like, this needs to end. If I can be a part of ending it, I will be. Um, I think the, 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 the major difference between Natasha Bannon or Bannon, like Steve Bannon, cause I'm like, is her name Bannon or is it Bannon? I'm just saying. Wow. Let that come out. Let the WikiLeaks on that come out. Yeah, let the WikiLeaks. Um, and Jessica Krug was that Natasha embedded herself within every Puerto Rican political and cultural space. Right? So when it came out, it was a gut punch. And I had to check myself at that moment and say, man, you know, this is this is a hard blow right now. But then one of my homegirls hit me up and was like, girl, she went to a CIA training. I was like, oh, okay, well, there it is. There, well, there we go. I didn't have any sympathy before that. But when my, my sister comrade hit me, I was like, yeah, of course she went to a CIA leadership retreat. And of course she embedded herself within every Puerto Rican independence movement space on the island, every after Hurricane Maria space, and then in every cultural bomba plena, Puerto Rico, Oscar Lopez Rivera, our political prisoners, of course she did, right? And her response was that she doubled down, was like, I might be white, but I've been so good to the Puerto Rican people. Like, thank you, paternalistic mommy. No. You know, and... What I what I had expressed to you, Jared, was that I was like, I can't believe how many particularly Puerto Rican men are giving her a pass. But after I had that conversation with you, I had to also look back at myself and say, well, I've never been accepted in the Puerto Rican community of political, let, let's say the political visibility. Um, I'm always the one that people call and they'll be like, but can you not talk about that race stuff? Can we just talk about being Puerto Rican? Well, yeah, if I was 16 and my whole identity was shaped, which it was about being Puerto Rican through my mom and my dad in an incredible way in my family, you know, I didn't even speak English until I moved to Westchester County. And the reason I stopped speaking Spanish was because my mom was like, I put you in English classes because I thought you would fit in better, which I understand that now that I look back at it, I understand that when my mom and my dad came to New York, there were still signs 
in certain buildings that say no Puerto Ricans, no Irish need apply. Mm. Right. My mom is light skin. My daddy, my dad is obviously a black Puerto Rican, you know, but all I ever knew was that I was Puerto Rican. So until I went to college and was exposed to black studies, Africana studies, exposed to James Turner, Hakeem Manabudi, Gwendolyn Brooks, Vivian Gordon, Lois Owens, I could go down the list. I only thought of myself as being Puerto Rican. I had never been asked, what race are you? Except one time in high school, when one of the white girls thought she could use the N word. And one of my African-American sisters was like, are you on that side or that one? I'm like, no, I'm with y'all. And I didn't, I knew. And, and, and personally now in, on this part, um, I have never dated a Puerto Rican man ever because the couple times that I was like hooked up with or like, oh, go on a dinner date. I was like, y'all want statehood. I'm like, I'm out of here, you know, which is why I ended up picking, of course, my amazing husband, Justice from Flatbush, Brooklyn, <laughs> you know, who, who got me because in Flatbush, Brooklyn, you're going to see Jamaicans. Afro-Panamanians and Haitians. I was the one that was like, dude, are you good? He's like, I'm good. Like your people are all here. Like we're all people, you know? So that, that has been my experience. So, you know, one of the, one of the things uh, I was wondering if you've seen any of this or how it's coming. Uh, uh, well, well, first of all, I want to come back specifically to that, that, to that issue of why are people, do you think, on the one hand, I think I could think some shady reasons why men would be happily willing to to let a woman slide on issues like this. Um, uh, I don't know if, if 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 my instincts are initially are, are correct on that, but but I just think there's so much shadiness uh, with with um, men towards women in these so called movement politics that I could easily see. You know what I'm saying? You know, especially if they think she's cute. Um, just let it slide. I don't, why would we have a problem with that? But the other thing that I was shocked or surprised was that, that the amount, but just in general, the amount of people you were expressing, uh, particularly uh, uh, on the island, who were willing to allow her to continue to be a spokesperson, saying that, that you know, something to the effect that she, you know, she, her, the, the net impact was more positive than negative. Yeah. Uh, so why mess up a good thing type of thing? And and then the other issue kind of extending from that is that I was thinking about is, well, because already there is there there is this um, ongoing backlash against so-called identity politics from both the left and the right. I mean, you know, so, I'm, I, you know, I think like this is going to throw another, you know, confusing uh, cog in the wheel, so to speak, on, on that, because, you know, on the left, you know, the the the. There's always that argument that identity politics are, you know, mess up the class struggle in some circles. And then on the right, there's people saying, see, it has nothing to do with race. It's it's all about something else. And it's all these people just want to bring race into everything. And it shouldn't matter because even they get bamboozled by a white girl. Um, so we should just ignore identity politics altogether. So, I, I mean, I can hear all of these these things happening. And, and so I'm just wondering how if, if any of that has crossed your mind in particular or what you think about these issues that I'm raising now, um, uh, which really just comes back to the role, as you see it, of identity and political struggle. Yeah, I mean, for me, what allows me to center myself in that politic is always France Fanon. He talks about colonized minds. I mean, colonized lands. And I talk about colonized minds. And in Puerto Rico, we've been colonized by the United States since 1898. Until the early 1990s, there was no school you could go to in Puerto Rico where the curriculum even talked about African descendants. Okay, it was like not happening. But also... When Pedro Abisu Campos, who some people will say he was Afro Latino, he I don't think he was in in that identity. I think he actually imbued himself more with um, the Christianity of like like every human should be who they are under the eye of God. But he also had a relationship with the Irish Republican Army. 
And it's the IRA that actually supplied the military might that the independence movement needed in Puerto Rico. Right. So then we could be like, well, that's not about identity. That's about freedom. The IRA is trying to get free and Puerto Rico is trying to get free. But Pedro Abisu Campos in the later part of his life was arrested. He was detained. He was put in a, um, a federal um, penal system in Atlanta. But when he was in his prison, there was a light that put was put on his cell where it gave him cancer. And although he didn't speak around this, let's say, like Black Puerto Rican identity, the numbers did speak to it. And the reason I even know this is because I got to go to Cornell <laughs> and get my master's under Dr. James Turner in Africana Studies. And Dr. Turner was like, go look at the census. And from 1850 to the early 1900s, the census in Puerto Rico is that 57% of those on the island are African descendants. But that memory and that has been erased. But also during the independence movement, our own flag was considered a violation and treason where we could not even fly the Puerto Rican flag. So every time somebody's like, why y'all so proud? I'm like, cause we couldn't fly it. That's why, because in 1898, both Puerto Rico and Cuba were supposed to be free, but Cuba got their freedom and Puerto Rico got colonialism. With that being said, I understand why there are people in Puerto Rico that are like, well, she has moved us towards independence. And it's like, has she? Or did she undercut everything we're supposed to be about? Because the Puerto Rican independence movement has had struggles around identity. It has been led by mostly white Puerto Ricans who are men, right? And who have not dealt with race, ethnicity, or gender well. Now you have a whole new generation of Puerto Ricans, particularly Afro black Puerto Ricans that are like, no, we're here and we exist. And actually some of the first slave rebellions came out of, in the Caribbean period, came out of Puerto Rico. The first slave rebellion in the Caribbean came from Luisa, Puerto Rico, which is where you will find most of the Afro descendants, black Puerto Ricans. So, you know, I think what she did is destructive. I have no need around restorative justice with her because once again, once you go to CIA training, I'm good. I kind of know where you stand. And that comes from Franz Fanon, Amos Wilson, and COINTELPRO. You know, and it, it, it makes me sad, but I also understand what that colonial mentality could be because I don't think I was directly impacted it impacted by it, but I do understand when I heard my mother and I talked to my mom when she was like, I didn't want you to be picked on. I didn't want you to be different. And that's part of the colonial mindset that our parents have, right? Like, I just want you to assimilate, you know, and, and at the end of the day, could I assimilate? Maybe a little bit, but it wasn't until I went to college that I could truly be like, oh, this is who I am. This is the history of my people. This is who we are. This is our part of the struggle and our resistance. And it also brings to me always a question. If people were to look at all the Caribbean island nations, I would urge people to really look at Puerto Rico and the effects of the CIA, the FBI, and the counterintelligence program. Why is Puerto Rico the most important island to destabilize? Why? Because there was a naval station in Vieques, Puerto Rico, where there were a lot of activities that took place to prepare men and women to go to war in the Middle East, Middle East, because it's considered the Southern Command of the Caribbean Sea. I remember them talking about that. I mean, I was in the Navy and they were talking about that. Um uh, the, the importance of VXS and and the, the the training and all of that. Um, uh, but they didn't. Uh, not that I recall, they didn't talk about the impact of that training on the people. Uh, you know, 
Uh, by the way, I was just looking it up. To be honest, I couldn't remember. The, I can't uh, always remember the, the the names of everything. But when you talk about the CIA in Latin America, we, we should also remind if, if, if folks need it of Operation Condor, uh, uh, at least, uh, which was uh, uh, basically the the, you know, the CIA sponsorship of, of uh, political assassination throughout uh, Latin America of anybody on the left. Um, so there's a lot of of reasons why this the, this country has uh, uh, wh- wh- anyway why you would want to be and others should be concerned about this woman uh, going to whatever CIA training and then popping up under yeah. false pretenses in in these communities. Uh, Let me just say this: as being um, born in the in the Bronx, you know, I hope I never see her again. Mm-hmm. That's what I'll say. Because um, all of this and the words might sound pretty, but this is dangerous. What she did is dangerous. What she has done is destabilize the Puerto Rican diaspora, which we have already been dealing with. Us as Puerto Ricans in the United States that don't live on the island, when we go back to the island, we are continually made fun of, questioned, what our loyalties are, you know, and there's something around the Puerto Rican independence movement that sees us in the United States as not part of the struggle, as opposed to saying there are more Puerto Ricans in the United States that there are in Puerto Rico. And most Puerto Ricans in the United States I think have a politic of freedom and not statehood. But right now, These questions are very important because there's this neoliberal fantasy of all of a sudden Puerto Rico becoming a state. And why? Because neoliberals are figuring out like, oh, wait, there's three million extra votes now that might likely be Democratic, which if you look at the trends, yes. But the bigger trend in Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans is that we have the highest electoral rate. In Puerto Rico, when there's an election, 90% of Puerto Ricans come to vote. And the the thing that would make people maybe understand this even more is that in Florida, right, I, I was very surprised that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris went to the expats of Venezuela or Cuba or Colombia instead of the 3.5 million people in Florida that are Puerto Rican that probably supported y'all if you had gone spoke to them, which could have totally flipped Florida. So I feel in all these discussions, Puerto Rico is always on the periphery whether it's race, ethnicity, or politics, especially in the United States where most of the politics of, quote, Latina, Latino, Latinx are seen within a Mexican lens and not uh, like Puerto Rican, Dominican Republic, Belize, you know, all these other um, places where we are obviously people of African and indigenous descent. Uh, Just real quick, Mick Jagermeister, if uh, you want to clarify what it is that you think uh, uh, our guest has wrong, we can check on that and, and okay. see if we can clarify that. I mean, she he said, I think it's a he or this person is saying that you're missing something. So we're happy to have you respond to a question. Of course, be respectful, obviously. Thank you, plus X1 for clearing that up. Uh, I thought that went without saying, but obviously if there's a disagreement or a question, we're happy to respond. It's not that deep. Uh, um, uh, I think I just lost my train for a quick second there. Um, I, oh, this que- I did want to come back to this question about who th- th- that that you know was sort of the title of this uh, of of who is Latina. Uh, you know, I know this is obviously you know this the question is is Latin American even the proper phrasing anymore? Uh, you know, with the Latinx popularity, with you know, this question is the basics of race versus ethnicity. Um, how do you address all of that, even going back to and, and how does this blend with your you know, still classic essay about who was black? Yeah, I mean, I identify as a black Puerto Rican, not black in Puerto Rican, but a black Puerto Rican. I don't mind if people um, hit me up around like, oh, you're Latina or Afro-Latina, which is fine, you know, because 
when I wrote Who is Black almost, no, not almost 20, 20 years ago, this coming June, um, it came from my experience in my political home of the Malcolm X grassroots movement where I was accepted for the most part. And it was just like a conversation of all of us. And somebody was like, oh, but Rosie, you know, y'all not really black. And I was like, your mom is half white, like European. My mom is still like Puerto Rican. So like, who is black? Um, and with, with that said, it's been the Malcolm X grassroots movement and so many elders including um, Dr. Marta um, uh, Moreno Vega and Carlos Russell, Umberto Brown, and so many other, Hakeem Anabudi, James Turner, again, like I've always had a home in that space, a, a home in a space of black and Africana, Pan-African studies, where I've never had a home in Latin American, Hispanic, or Puerto Rican studies, or Chicano studies. and. The reason I don't is because I am very clear. I'm a black Puerto Rican and people are like, you're mad light. I'm like, yes, yeah, so are biracial people. Like for me, I understand the privilege that I do have as a lighter skinned person, which I think speaks to colorism. And if anybody really wants to understand or study colorism in this country, they need to read the work of Dr. Yaba Blay. And and what she did with one drop and and the new the new release of one drop and updated thing, and for me, I've always been accepted in what we call black spaces, you know. Um, and I I earlier I just said I never dated a Puerto Rican man. Well, part of it was because the couple of times I got set up, they were just mad patriarchal. But it was one of my my last boyfriend before I went to college in high school. He was part of the nation God, of the nation of gods and earth, the five percenters. He took me to go see in Harlem when Mandela um, spoke, and he would always be like, "Yo, sis, you you know you're light skinned, but that's not the issue right now. Like we're all African, we're black descendants." So when I went to college, it kind of affirmed that for me when it was. Um, quote, African-American spaces that brought me in. But when I joined the Albany State University Black Alliance, at when I first went to the meeting, I was like, I don't know if I belong. And the brother, Derek Westbrook, who was the president, was like, are you of African descent? I was like, I don't know, I'm Puerto Rican. And he was like, okay, you are. Okay, come to the meeting. Where it was the Latino organization that was like, why do you want to even talk about this? Like, you know, all we do is speak Spanish. I'm like, yo, I speak Spanish too, but there are other folks that are Hispanic at that moment that don't speak Spanish. So like, what makes you Puerto Rican? Is it that you speak Spanish? I do. Do you go to the island? I do. Have you been there lately? I do. <laughs> but I was still and, and still am not welcomed in those spaces. And what Dr. Vega taught me is she's like, don't want to be welcome, create your own space. Right on. Well, like like my godfather, you know, Tom Porter says all the time, I'm never surprised when I'm asked to leave. I'm only surprised by how long I've been invited to stay. Yeah. And, and, and I, I fully em, you know, embrace that. Real quick before we move on, have you are you familiar with this book, uh, War on Puerto Ricans, on all Puerto Ricans? <laughs> With it. Wait, hold on, hold on, real quick. Oh, don't knock it down, because I was about. That's what I was about to ask about. Ask you about next. Yes. Of course. And and I can still go ahead. Ask the question. I'll put it up. Well, go the ahead. question, the 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 question just was, what's your opinion about the book? Uh, um, I can't. I'm not familiar with it, so I. Oh no! It's it's probably the the best. No, it is not probably. It is the best book on talks about the terror um, inflicted on the Puerto Rican independence movement and in America's colony. Yes, it's it, if, if we had a list of books where you're like, what does sociology look like? W.E.B. Du Bois, Reconstruction or the, his first book. War Against All Puerto Ricans, everybody should read because people don't understand the colonial aspect of Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico is the last colony of the United States. 
So why would they want to big that up unless it's for more votes? So yes, I would recommend everybody read this book. It talks about the Bonsai Massacre, um, the the uh, terror inflicted on the Puerto Rican independence movement. Again, what happened to Pedro Abisu Campos with putting a light in his cell where he got cancer. Um, the three Puerto Rican independence leaders that went to the Congress in 1954 to make their reality known to those Congress people. Like we That's to- well put. I like and how al- you put that. Yeah. And also the FALN, um, which was the, the, the movement that, you know, I, I w- I've been reading so much again uh, around the uh, transcripts of the FALN, um, and that's the Puerto Rican independence movement in the United States. And if people would read that, right, we Puerto Rican independence fighters are the only people until recently with this new uh, wave of terror on Janu- January 6th at the white, uh, at the Capitol that have ever in this country been charged with seditious conspiracy and convicted. And all those Puerto Rican freedom fighters got over 99 years in jail. All of them are free now because of the work of the movement. Right on, right on. Uh, Please do folks, especially those uh, uh, most lively in the chat, uh make sure you're subscribed and uh if you can uh spare a few dollars a month and i understand if you can't but we are building a, a journalism and media project uh and could use your support uh please click that join button as well uh um yeah but anyway so let's let me let, you know you you got the poster behind you albeit you know we knocked it down for good for good cause i mean it was a worthy cause uh um but but the film is on its way to to, to coming out and um uh but let's let's yeah that's a dope shirt it's a dope so shirt if you don't understand why we black this <laughs> As, there, as y'all can say, this is red, black, and green. Marcus Garvey, UNIA flag in Puerto Rico. And of course, Garvey did work there as 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 all throughout the the Caribbean and and including Earth, Brazil, Southern, including <laughs> Brazil, absolutely. Um, uh, anyway, so so talk about why why is that poster up behind you and and what you're. <laughs> What what is your relationship to it, and is your name actually on that one? Um, no, because no. I no, it's fine. I'm sorry, but if I literally just got this posted today because I ordered it myself, <laughs> I, was, I need to order this poster right now. So everybody, um, Judas and the Black Messiah coming out February 12th. If people go to theaters, which I know most people won't, but you can see it on HBO Max. Um. You know, it's a it's a biopic about the life and death of Fred Hampton Sr., who was um, assassinated along with his comrade Mark Clark on December 4th, 1969, by the Chicago police, the FBI, and I'm sure the CIA. You know, we've been working on this for three years. And um, what I will tell everybody is that Fred Hampton and his family and other Black Panthers have been involved. I think there will be critiques on the on the movie as Probably they should be, as it's a biopic and not a documentary. But I'm just so humbled and grateful to have been part of it and be an associate producer on it. It's Ryan Coogler's first movie after Black Panther. Uh, Shaka Keen is the writer and director. Akua and Jerry, and people call him Amu Akua, Conrad and Akua, as well as Fred Hampton Jr., the son of Fred Hampton Sr., Chairman Fred Hampton, have been involved in it. And I can't wait for people to see it. And I'm ready for the critiques. I'm also ready for the amount of people that will see what happened to Fred Hampton, but also how he created the Rainbow Coalition. I've been telling a lot of Boricuas, like, yo, get ready, because this film is the only major uh, film out of a major studio, Warner Brothers, 
that depicts Puerto Ricans via the Young Lords Party. So in the movie, you will see Chacha Jimenez, who's the founder of the Young Lords Party. He founded it when he met Fred Hampton, who was like, let's switch some of that energy towards people's um, work. And I have to say, when I watched the, the final edit and I saw the Young Lords represented, I cried. And I- So you've seen the edit though? You've seen it though? Of course I've seen it. I'm an associate producer. Well, my bad. Last time we talked, you hadn't seen it yet. So I didn't know. I I have seen it now. And so he so he's in there. So Cha Cha's in there. Chacha's in it. The young ones are represented. You know, um I happen to be on the set when one of the most powerful scenes of the movie when Fred Hampton is released from prison and comes to talk to the people are there. You know, and I was on the set when Chacha Jimenez was there. And to hear him break down that last night, he was one of the last people to see Fred Hampton alive. And he said, I was one of the last people to see him before he was assassinated. And two days later, I was car I was a pallbearer in his funeral. You know, and I was, I was like, you know, this is an incredible way to also show particularly how the African-American community and Puerto Rican community have been in struggle together because there's this whole narrative right now that I hate and I fight against where people are like Latinos, Latina, Latinx people are anti-black. I'm like, first, the world is anti-black. Um, but also, how do we not talk about the history of us working together? There would be no Young Lords without the Black Panther Party for self-defense. There would be no American Indian movement. There would be no white patriots. There would be no Asian struggle. There would be no Brown Berets. I think it's easier for people to be like, we're in conflict, as opposed to saying, wait, our conflict is with white supremacy, not each other. There could be things there that we're like, we need to work on, we need to deal with, but I hate this narrative right now that it's like all of a sudden white supremacy is the people that don't put us in conflict as opposed to looking at our history. And let's say past the young, uh, before the young lords, on, on January 24th was the birthday of Arturo Afonso Schomburg, a black boy, Tohican, that if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't even be having the discussion with you. And I certainly would not be going to Harlem on 125th Street when I can to the Schomburg Library. And when you read Schomburg's work, he was in concert with Pan-Africanism, Marcus Garvey. He was a mentor to John Herrick Clark when John Herrick Clark was a student. And he collected so many things around us as a people of African descent. Um, a lot of people think he's German because the name is Schomburg, but he was a black Puerto Rican that was exiled from Puerto Rico for fighting for independence. So then when he came here, he was like, I'm just gonna go around the world and collect anything of what I think about is the Negro. You know, so I think all of that in a way reflects in the movie, but I think it it asks us to be like, why are we against each other when we know who the real enemy is? Like, I'm not the enemy. You're not the enemy. Like, white supremacy is the enemy. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, yeah, absolutely. And, and um, I mean, there's always, you know, conservative and reactionary responses to a, an observable problem. So, I mean, yes, there are issues between black and brown communities. There are issues within black and brown communities. Uh, but to take them outside of the context, uh, um, like people have put, you know, this whole thing about, uh, you know, the, 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 the reason people can be, the reason the behavior of crabs in a barrel can be criticized is because crabs don't belong in a barrel. <laughs> a barrel is not a natural <laughs> domicile for a crab. Uh, so this, the same, you know, uh, um, so I'll be interested to see that, and I hope it does reflect in, in the film, because this issue between black and brown communities and the, and the tensions being, uh, uh, I think, exacerbated by poor representation and, and, and description of the problems is, is a problem. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. And that, I, that's absolutely 100 percent. I mean, that's part of the movie, and I think that's powerful, you know. But I, I, I also understand right now that what people visually see 
of us as a as a community is white passing white looking latino latino latinx people right um and i say this with the understanding that i know i am more on the light side than the dark side which when i when i encounter younger people who are going through their identity process themselves what i will say to them and what i usually say period is that Yes, there's a phenotype, right? Um, but there are bat people that are who consider some biracial that are even lighter than me. My sister's darker than me. My father's darker than me. I'm the middle, and then my mom and my dad, my mom and my brother are white, basically, like phenotypically. But what I tell people is like I view myself within a black political tradition. I take on the work of Pan-Africanism, but also the black radical tradition that Robin Kelly speaks about, Cornel West speaks about, and that my mentor um, Vivian Verdell Gordon spoke about, and also doc, Dr. James Turney spoke about. You know, and when I went to Cornell, for me, those two years were the most liberating years for me. Because Dr. Turner, every time I would talk to him, he's like, it's about what is your politic? Do you believe in freedom for this? Are you anti-capitalist? Are you anti-surveillance? Yes, yes. He's like, then you're within the black political tradition. But the flip side of that is I always tell others who um, identify as Afro-Black, Latino, Latino, Latinx, is that there is also certain African-American struggle that we haven't been through, right? I am not a descendant of african enslaved in America, but I will fight for reparations for those people just as I will fight for Native Americans to get their land back. So it's like when you come into this identity, you're like, yo, I'm not black. Everything's black. And you're like, yes, but you still have a little bit of privilege. Your last name might give you that. Your light skin might give you that. And let's always center the African-American freedom struggle. And then this past couple of years, whether I agree with the politics of a two-party system, what I will not, you know, let go unnoticed is that African-American women delivered America once again. <laughs> you know. uh, well, listen, listen, we're, on, on that note, we, let, let's go ahead and, and, and break uh, uh, the conversation here uh, so we could take a quick break and come back and invite everybody to do the same. Take a quick break. Uh, uh, hit the restroom, get a refill of of whatever the 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 libation of choice is, and then let's come back in, again. Where Rosa's going to continue to join us with with our dear comrade Kali Akuno for I think a, it's a it's a nice segue from uh, uh, the politics of identity or identity politics to uh, uh, cinematic representation of those politics to a next hour discussion specifically about uh, what at least we're calling for now a new wave of black exploitation film. Uh, and I couldn't think of two better people to speak about any of that with than the two of you. So let's take a quick break. Everybody come on back to the YouTube channel, or if you're not watching there, find the appropriate link or just go to imixwhatilike.org in about 10 minutes and, and join us once more for more of I Mix What I Like Live with Rosa Clemente and Kali Acuna. Rosa, thanks again for, for joining me this hour. We'll, we'll, we'll catch up with you in a minute. All right, every, you, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So, all right, everybody, let's, let's, let's keep on rocking. Take a quick break. We'll see you over there in a minute. And as always, as we were just even discussing, as Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody. See you in a minute. Right here it with I mix what I like live. Don't go anywhere, peace. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. 